Monday. Yeah. And I realized you can go to the freaking grade book and get the review for it. And I have it written down on me. <laughs> like I had it written down in MS Paint on me. <laughs> Uh, so, Dr. Gan says you've been... You've been talking about the costs of inflation. Uh, and one of the, the costs is certainly that the, 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 um, the, the idea of noise, the idea that when prices change, uh, you don't really know what the price what is worth. Uh, if you knew that the price of gasoline was, say, $2.20 a gallon last week, um, that's old information. When prices are changing rapidly, uh, the fact that it was $2.20 a gallon last week might not help you. Uh, you want to look around town, you see a gas station that says uh, the price of gas is two fifty a gallon, you say, oh, that's too high. But uh, maybe if you looked around at other gas stations, they're up to two sixty. So when prices are stable, old information is still useful to you. You've got an idea what's a fair price, what's a good price. Uh, but when prices are changing rapidly, uh, as, as when you have inflation, uh, you lose that kind of information. The, the value of a price uh, diminishes if it's not really up-to-date information. Uh, distortions in the tax system, probably talked about this last time. Um, distortions in the tax system, there's bracket creep. If you're, you know, your income, maybe you've got a certain income and you're in the 25% tax bracket, if they put you over the line, then you're into the, you know, if your inflation raises your income, uh, but the tax brackets don't change, then you're put into the next tax bracket. You may end up paying 35% instead of 25% tax. Uh, these days, though, though the... Uh, the government does, the federal government anyway, indexes the tax brackets. So the, the federal income tax brackets increase along with inflation, although there is, of course, a certain amount of lag. Uh, capital gains, um, okay, capital depreciation allowance is not indexed, yeah. Um, capital gains are just nominal value. If you've got a, an asset. You've got a house that's uh, worth $100,000. Inflation raises that to 120. You're really not any richer because if you tried to sell that house and buy goods, it would still be worth $120. Uh, but um, but uh, you know, it, you've got a house that's worth 120. It'll cost you 100. You can buy $120 worth of goods, but those goods are the same as what you could have bought in the past. Uh, but the government would say, oh, well, you made a, you made a capital gain. You got a $20,000 capital gain. You bought it for $100,000, sold it for $120,000, got a capital gain. Uh, shoe leather cost, just the, the effort that you've got to go through to, to find out what's a good price. Okay. So those were topics you should have talked about last time. Um, other costs? Uh, because it affects the, the tax system, it may have an impact on people's desire to work. If you're put into a higher tax bracket, it's not just that you're going to be paying uh, a higher tax rate, but there's the other effect that because you're paying a higher tax rate, you may decide you're not going to work as much. Or to, if there's a tax on investment, if there's a higher if inflation, boost somebody, somebody into a higher tax bracket for investment costs, uh, investment expenses, then that person might not invest as much. Uh, the redistribution of wealth. Some people have said that inflation is a tax because it, uh, it has the effect of redistributing wealth from some people to other people, um, from workers uh, to employers if the if wages are not indexed. If the wages lag behind the, the, the growth of prices, the employer is selling goods at higher prices because of inflation. But if the wages are lagging behind, uh, then, the, then the workers are effectively working for, for lower wages. 
and that's a way of transferring income from workers to employees. Also from lenders to borrowers. Uh, again, if the inflation is not anticipated, people don't expect it, uh, the, a borrower and a lender agree to a certain interest rate, but as we'll, as we'll see, uh, the, the borrower should have charged a higher interest rate because of inflation. If the borrower didn't anticipate it and didn't build in a higher inflation uh, into the loan agreement, higher interest rate to the loan agreement, then the borrower is going to lose money uh, at the expense of, uh, excuse me, the, the lender. This says from lenders to borrowers. Uh, not sure that's correct. Um, usually when there's unanticipated inflation, uh, it is, yeah, yeah it's, it is the borrower who, who benefits. The lender, uh, who's, who's going to be worse off because of the inflation, the lender should have built in a higher interest rate. Okay. Um, uh, interference with long-run planning. This is, in my opinion, this is uh, probably the most significant. It becomes very difficult to plan. The businesses hate uncertainty. So if they're not sure what the inflation rate's going to be or what prices are going to be like two years from now, five years from now, it makes it very difficult for businesses to, to make plans. Uh, so they're not going to make the investments, uh, not, not being sure that those are going to be profitable. Uh, individuals really have no idea how much an individual is going to need to save for retirement. To be cautious, an individual would an individual worker would have to save more just in case inflation really gets bad, just in case the person's going to need a bigger retirement nest egg. Um, but also, of course, when people are saving more, they're spending less, and that means that they're, uh, well, they're, they're, they're not generating extra income into the, into the circular flow of money through the economy. Uh, and as I said, investment and business strategies may go out the window if people don't know how to plan because they don't know what the future prices are going to be. Okay. Now we've been talking about the effect of inflation on lenders and borrowers. I want to look at that in a little more detail here. The interest rate, the real interest rate, uh, is defined roughly. Uh, this is approximate, but it's a pretty good approximation if the interest rates are low and the inflation rate is low. Uh, the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus the rate of inflation. So R stands for the real interest rate. I stands for the nominal interest rate. Oh, okay, thank you. Has the list been all the way around now? Okay. I stands for the nominal interest rate. Uh, and pi, <coughs> Greek letter pi here is the rate of inflation. The nominal interest rate is the interest rate that you would see when you walk into a bank and they say, well, we're charging 13% uh, on auto loans today. That's a nominal interest rate. Nominal means that it's the interest rate that is stated, quoted. It's going to be the interest rate that's written into a loan agreement. Um, but the real interest rate tells you what the increase in your purchasing power is going to be. If, you, if you're a lender, you lend money, uh, the real interest rate is how much your purchasing power increases for every dollar that you, that you lend. And when there's inflation, your purchasing power, the purchasing power of the money that you get back from the loan, after, after the loan's been paid back, it's going to be worth less. So the real interest rate when there's inflation is going to be lower than the, the stated, the nominal interest rate. nominal interest rate, the market interest rate, um, the annual percentage increase in the nominal value of the financial asset. Yeah. Real interest rate, the increase in the purchasing power of the financial asset. So here are some interest rates. Um, people in the back might have a hard time reading that, but uh, some, some inflation rates and some real interest rates in, in uh, well, the year 2010, 
down at the bottom of the table, it says the nominal interest rate was 3.2%. The inflation rate was only 1.6% shortly after the Great Recession, so uh, inflation rates were down. Um, and that meant that the, the real interest rate would be the 3.2 minus the 1.6 gives us 1.6. For the, for the real interest rate. Um, but if you look at the, the table, you can see that in 1980, we had a 13.5% rate of inflation, 13.5% inflation. Uh, the nominal interest rate was 11.4%. That's quite high. By historical standards, that's, uh, that's quite high. Uh, but it wasn't high enough because with 13.5% inflation, the real interest rate, do the subtraction, the real interest rate was to negative 2.1%. That means if you were a lender, if you lent $100 over the year, you're going to lose, and you're going to get 13.5% interest back from the loan, but inflation, uh, you know, you're going to get 114 That was the nominal interest rate. You're going to earn... 11.4% interest, nominal interest on that loan, but you're going to lose 13 and a half because of inflation, so you're actually going to lose, um, out of $100, you're going to lose uh, $2.10 purchasing power. You're not going to be able to buy as much afterwards. Um, the 1975-1980, when you had those higher rates of inflation, that was when OPEC was raising oil prices, and the oil prices were contributing, the, the rising oil prices were contributing a lot to, to inflation in the United States. Uh, here's a, a table that shows the, the real interest rates. So you see that <clears throat> in between, in between the 1975 and 1980, uh, we did have a period where interest rates were a little bit more normal. Uh, I think of something around the 4 or 5 percent being more normal. Uh, interest rates like 9.5, real interest rates 9.5 percent. A little on the high side, kind of high. Um, but <clears throat> what we've been seeing lately, uh, interest rates these are real interest rates, but uh, lately we've been seeing nominal interest rates that are almost zero. The Federal Reserve System's thinking about whether they're going to raise interest rates, but they're, uh, that's the nominal interest rate that the Federal Reserve System controls, and the, the real interest rates can be lower than that. So who benefits? Who benefits from unanticipated inflation? And it's important to remember that we're talking about unanticipated inflation. Because if you expect inflation, if you anticipate it, there are things you can do to protect yourself against the inflation. You build in a higher interest rate. If you want to have a 6% interest rate, 6% real interest rate, 6% return on your funds for, for, as a reward for having made the, made the loan, for taking the risks and such. If you want 6%, you think there's 4% inflation. You think that over the next, over the life of this loan, there's going to be 4% inflation. Then what interest rate should you charge the, the borrower? If you're, you're expecting 6%, you want a 6% real interest rate. As a lender, you want 6%. You expect 4% inflation. That's higher than we've been having lately, but suppose you expect 4%. What nominal interest rate should you charge the, the borrower? 10, yeah, to add the 6% and the 4% gives you the nominal rate. So uh, yeah, unexpected inflation benefits borrowers and hurts lenders because the lender should have been charging higher interest rate um, to, to cover the cost of the inflation. Um, 
the the lender, excuse me, the borrower is better off. The borrower is better off because of inflation because when the when it's time to pay back the loan, the the the, the borrower is going to be paying back with money that's not worth as much. If prices are higher, probably the worker's the, the, the borrower's salary is higher. So it's going to be easier for the borrower to pay off the loan. Uh, if this is a business borrower, the, the business is going to be selling goods that have higher prices because of inflation. So the, the, again, the borrower is going to find it easier to, uh, to pay off the loan. So inflation, unanticipated inflation, hurts the lenders, uh, but it benefits the borrowers. Um, and yes. Yeah, if they can adjust the nominal interest rate, if they anticipate it, uh, they can make an adjustment uh, that they would uh, that they're not they're not going to be hurt. Um, some kinds of loans automatically adjust themselves, adjust the interest rate. Have you heard of a kind of a loan where the interest rate changes as the rate of inflation changes? Mostly your car loans are going to be fixed interest. If you've got credit card interest, in some cases the credit card rate's going to go up um, as the interest rate, inflation rate rises. Some of you are paying 23.5% interest. I don't think they're going to raise that. Um, but uh, one kind, you guys probably don't have to worry about this yet, but the adjusted rate, uh, adjustable rate mortgage, adjustable rate mortgage, an ARM, um, has it's a long-term loan, and so over the course of that loan, the inflation rate could easily rise. And so banks like to protect themselves against the possibility of an increase in inflation uh, by saying, well, we're going to tie the, the loan on the interest rate on this mortgage, this long-term mortgage, to some, uh, some short-term interest rate that's going to rise and fall with the rate of inflation. What else here? Okay, the Fisher effect. Uh, the Fisher effect is the tendency for nominal interest rates to be high when inflation is high. And that's because of that equation that the nominal rate is going to be approximately the real interest rate plus the rate of inflation. So if the, if the lenders want a certain, uh, certain real interest rate and the borrowers are willing to pay a certain real interest rate, then when there's inflation, that just adds to the adds to the nominal rate. So when the inflation is high, interest rates tend to be high. We saw that back in the 70, 1975 and 1980 with the, the table. The, uh, the nominal rates were, were high, uh, but not quite as high as the rate of inflation back then. Uh, and to, then to illustrate that, again, 19, 1980, we saw very high inflation rates, and with a lag, it took people a while to, to adjust to it, but with the lag, the nominal interest rate uh, was, was, uh, was also quite high. Uh, in 1973 or so, that was the, the first oil, oil shock, the first time OPEC raised oil prices, uh, the inflation rate, the, the inflation rate was about 12 percent, a little over 12. A little over 12 percent here, uh, and you see that the nominal interest rate did increase during that time period, but not enough to uh, to accommodate the the or to adjust for the full increase in the rate of inflation at that time. And then, as well. Since 1990 or so, we've seen the nom we've seen in, uh, the inflation rate more or less under control at around two or three percent, uh, and we've seen the nominal interest rate falling from the highs that it had back in the 1980s and 90s uh, down to the low nominal interest rates that we've got these days. Okay, do you have questions about Chapter Five about inflation? And uh, who, who benefits, who's hurt by inflation? Who else is hurt by inflation? Unanticipated inflation. We talked about borrowers and lenders, but who else might be hurt by inflation? 
businesses. What kind of businesses? Banks? Mm. If it's unanticipated, banks tend to be borrowers. It's going to be the banks tend to be lenders, and so, uh, yeah, they're going to be hurt. Financial they're going to be hurt. investors. Uh, what kind of investors? Financial. Financial investors. Uh, it depends on what kind of investments they've made. But aside from the financial sphere, what about retirement? People on retirement. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of re retired people are you thinking about? Four hundred one k. People on a 401k, very likely, yeah. Very few 401k, very few private pension plans are adjusted for inflation. If you've been putting aside a certain amount of money every, every month, every paycheck, get to retirement, say, okay, I hope I've got enough to live on now. Um, but you've got a fixed amount of money, fixed pool of money there to, to use. It's going to grow according to the interest rate at that time. Uh, but when there's inflation, that might not be enough for you to, to live on, if, if there's been inflation in the meantime. Uh, Social Security used to be just fixed. Congress would, Congress would raise the Social Security benefits once in a while. Uh, uh, more recently, the last 10, 20 years, I think, perhaps, uh, Congress has done it automatically. The Social Security law says Social Security benefits will rise once a year uh, based on the rate of inflation over the past year. So once a year, you know, Social Security, uh, what's a big item in the newspapers? What's the Social Security increase this year? Is it 3%, 2%? What's it going to be? Uh, seniors tend to feel great that they're, they're getting that increase. But it's just keeping up with the rate of inflation. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really do much. Um, and uh, I think the last year there wasn't an increase, and people were complaining. But that's just keeping up with inflation. And inflation's been so low recently that there there wasn't an increase in social security benefits. Yeah. So people that are on fixed income, like people on pension plans, not social security, um, but pension, private pension plans, generally are fixed payments. Or 401k, yeah, fixed pool of money there. Um, who else? Uh, people who have low skills, people who are older workers, these are people who are less likely to get raises when there's inflation. Uh, if there's a young worker, a very highly skilled worker, that person's likely to, to have a good argument when the guy goes to the boss and says, hey, boss, I want a raise. There's been... 10% inflation, I need to have my wages uh, raised just to keep up with that. The boss will say, fine, don't want to lose you. But if there's a poorly skilled worker, the boss will say, well, if you really think you can get a better job, better salary elsewhere, go find it. Um, I'm not going to give you the raise. I can replace you too easily. I don't need to keep you. I don't need to do whatever I can to keep you. The older worker, the... The boss probably knows that, that older worker is close to retirement, so that person will probably stay with the stay with the job, probably not shift to another job. Um, so again, uh, that person is like less likely to get the raise, but the younger worker, the, the highly skilled worker, is more likely to get the, the raise. And so inflation tends to benefit the young, highly skilled worker and tends to hurt the poorly skilled workers and the uh, and the older workers. Chapter 6. Wages and unemployment. This is, of course, in macroeconomics, uh, and usually in macroeconomics we just treat all of the different markets pretty much uh, the same, but labor is special uh, because three quarters of the American uh, but yeah, about three quarters of the American population receives income in the form of wages, as opposed to payments for use of capital, interest, or you know, rent and such. So it's a very important source of income. It's also a cost. Uh, 
the wage rates are cost to business. So we want to think about how, how wage rates are determined, factors that will influence them. Now there are two things that will affect, that will determine a worker's wage rates or the, the demand, really thinking about the demand for labor here. Uh, this is the demand for labor, which in turn will affect the wage rates. So I'm thinking about a demand curve. Remember the demand curve. When we say demand, we're really thinking about the relationship between the price and the quantity that the buyers demand. In this case, um, who demands labor? Consumers. Not the consumers. Mortars. Producers. Yeah, the producers. I if I buy a banana, I'm the one who pays for the banana. I get to use it. Uh, if I buy labor, I am the one who pays for the labor, and I get to use the labor. So it's the employers who demand labor. It's the employers who are paying to, to use somebody's labor. So we're thinking about the demand curve for labor on the part of, or on the part of employers. Now, there are two things that will make an employer more interested in hiring workers. Uh, in terms of the demand curve, that is. Uh, one is the productivity. Because even if the wage rate doesn't change, the, the, and the workers become more productive, then that's going to make the, the employer more interested in hiring those workers. Um, and the other thing is the price of the output. If the goods that the worker produces have higher prices on them now, then even though the worker's producing just as many units per hour as the worker used to produce, those goods have higher prices, and so it's, easy, it's, you know, it's easier for the employer to pay that worker's wages. And they're more interested in, in hiring workers then. So both of these things would shift the demand curve to the right. Here's an example. Um, We've got number of workers. Uh, this is output per year. So if, they, if the company has zero workers, and obviously they get zero output, no computers produced. <coughs> One worker can produce 25, work, uh, 25 computers a year. <coughs> but if we go, <coughs> go down toward the bottom of the table, um, Six workers can produce 120, seven workers 133, eight, <coughs> eight, <coughs> yeah. eight workers can produce 144. <coughs> um, I should point out one assumption that we've built into this, <coughs> and that is that we've got diminishing returns. The first worker is very productive. The first worker can produce 25 computers a year. Add a second worker. The second worker raises production to 48 computers per year, uh, which means that the second worker added 23 computers per year to the output. But when we get down to the bottom of the list, Adding the eighth worker only adds 11 computers. So what's happening probably is that the, well, if you're assigning your very first worker, you're the manager, you assign the very first worker to producing computers, you're going to assign that person to the most important tasks. And those would be the most productive tasks. But when you're, after you've added seven workers and you're thinking about adding the eighth worker, the tasks probably aren't going to be as important. The tasks that are left to, to be done aren't going to be quite as productive, and so the additional worker is not going to have quite as much uh, extra productivity. So we calculate the marginal product. Have you talked about the marginal product in this class? How many of you have had Econ 2020? Yeah. Okay, you, you probably you must have talked about marginal product in that class. So, um, as I said, the first worker increases production <coughs> by, by 25 units. The second worker adds 23 to the product. 
by the time we get down to the end of the table, the bottom of the table, the eighth worker only adds uh, 11. <clears throat> the, the definition of the marginal product would be the change in the output divided by the change in the number of workers, in this case, the input is labor. So it's the change in the output divided by the change in the number of workers, but we're increasing the number of workers by one each step down the table. <clears throat> so the denominator is always one, and we just need to think about the change in the quantity of output. Now, the value of the marginal product is defined as the price of the output, assuming the price stays the same, stays constant. <clears throat> it's the price of the product that the workers are making per unit times the marginal product of the workers. In other words, this first worker can produce 25 computers, and having that, having that first worker adds 25 computers to the business's output. If those 25 computers are worth $3,000 a piece, then hiring that worker brings in $75,000 of revenue. 3,000 time, 3, times 25 computers is $75,000 worth of revenue. And then similarly, the, the second worker adds $69,000 worth of revenue because this, the computers still cost $3,000, but the second worker's productivity, marginal product, was not quite as great as the first worker's. Again, it might be because that worker was not as good a worker, but it could also be because the tasks are different. The marginal product then falls to 23. Uh, and the, the, yeah, the value of the marginal product falls to 69,000. So, uh, how many, here the question is, how many workers should this company hire? Well, we don't have enough information to answer that question yet, do we? What information do we need to know? How much um, the workers make. Yeah. Yeah, we need to know how much it's going to cost them. This table, that last column, value of marginal product, tells how much the extra worker is going to bring in, but we don't know how much the employer is going to have to pay out to hire that worker. So suppose the extra worker, well, suppose each worker, this is per year, so let's suppose each one of these workers uh, costs $65,000. The employer has to pay $65,000. That includes payroll taxes. It includes health benefits. It includes everything. The, the, worker, the employer has to pay $65,000 per year. Is it worth it to hire the first worker? Sure. Yeah. If, they can, if the company can pay out $65,000 to hire the first worker, but that first worker brings in <coughs> $75,000, then obviously the employer is coming out ahead. Should the employer hire the second worker? Yeah. Yes, again, because the 69,000 is still bigger than 65, so it pays to hire the, the second worker. What about the third worker? Should the, should the employer hire the third worker? Yeah. No, yeah, that's right. Because this time, uh, it's not worth it. The, the, the employer's gonna have to pay 65,000. That's the going salary. Uh, but the worker's only going to bring in 63, so it's not worth it. Uh, if the, if, but what if we cut the wage rate? What if we cut the salary? Instead of 65, what if it's 60,000? What does that do to the number of workers the firm wants to hire? You have, more you have an increase, sure. How many workers, if the if the salary, the annual cost of hiring a worker, each one of these workers is now 60,000, how many workers should the company hire? Three. Three. Three, yes. When it was 65, how, much, how many workers were they going to hire? Mm -hmm. Two. Two, right. Um, what, if we, what if we drop the, the annual cost of labor to 50,000 per worker? How many? Five, yeah. So just keep going down the table until it's no longer worthwhile to hire the extra worker. 
So at least yes, add 60,000. We said three workers at 50,000. 50,000 per worker, they're going to hire five workers. Uh, so the point is that uh, because we've got diminishing returns, because we've got a downward sloping marginal product, and when you multiply the marginal product times the price of the computers, the 3,000, you get a downward sloping value of the marginal product. That value of marginal product is the firm's demand curve. It tells you the relationship between the price of labor and how many workers that work employer wants to hire. So that makes it the company's demand for labor. Um, yeah, she's pointing out down here that the firm will hire and hire additional workers as long as the value of the marginal product is greater than the wage rate. When you lower the wage rate, then you're going down the demand curve for labor and the firm's willing to hire more hours of labor. So as I said, this is the demand for labor. Uh, the, lower the, the lower the wage, the greater the number of workers hired. The wage rate can be measured in nominal terms or in real terms. Nominal is just what the what your contract says, what you're getting, what your paycheck says, um, aside from the deductions. It's your gross on your paycheck. The real wage would be the wage rate adjusted for inflation. So we, uh, we, we divide by the price index <coughs> to, to get the real wage. Supply and demand in the labor market. Um, Okay, we know that uh, we have shifts in the demand for labor. We said that there are two things that are going to affect the demand curve. One is the price of the computers. Okay. Go back to that table. What if the price of the computers increased to 4,000? In this table, we were computing the value of the marginal product, assuming that the price was 3,000. What if we increase that to 4,000? What's that going to do to the, to the curve? It's going to shift it upward, but that's the same as shifting it to the right. Get an increase in demand. Yeah. Also, the productivity. Yeah, if, if workers could produce more. Oh, here she, she's got a similar table. I said 4,000. She's boosting up to 5,000. These better be good computers. Um, so as the, uh, yeah, value of the marginal product increases. Um, now, with the computer costing, selling for $5,000, how many workers would the employer be willing to hire if the salary, the cost of labor is $60,000 a year? 60000 a year. Seven. 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 Yeah, we go down here to the... It's, really, it's worthwhile to hire the seventh one, not worthwhile to hire the eighth one. So they hire seven. But you remember previously they he said that when a computer was only worth 3,000, the employer only wanted to hire three workers. So raising the price of the product increases the, what shifts the value of marginal product, shifts the demand curve to the right, and it increases the quantity of workers that the firm wants to hire at any given wage rate. Um, higher price of output increases the demand for labor, so that shifts the demand curve to the right. When the price of the product increases, that shifts the curve to the right. You get an increase in the demand. Um, Oh, in this one, we've shown the effect of the increase in productivity. Notice that the output per year <coughs> looks like it's increased by 50%. Well, not strictly 50%. Um, but that increased the value of the marginal product, and so again, that shifts the demand to, to the right. And increase, the productivity, increase the productivity of labor, or increase the value of the goods that the workers are producing, 
the selling price of the goods the workers are producing, either one of those makes the employer want to hire more workers <coughs> at any given wage rate. So that means the demand curve shifts off to the right. Um, okay, um, I, I feel confident that Dr. Gan will be feeling better and back with you guys on Thursday. Friday. That's right, you guys are Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So Friday, two days, but you'll be back.